thank you all so much for being here. It's great to see uh, this crowd uh, from all over the, the college and the community. So welcome. I'm so pleased uh, to be able to welcome to Westmont uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. We're, we're privileged to have her here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her and introduce her and then let her get started. So Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on developing and applying high resolution climate projections to understand what climate change means for people and the natural environment. She is a professor and director of the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech University. She has a bachelor's in physics from the University of Toronto and master's and PhD from, in atmospheric science from the University of Illinois. Dr. Hayhoe has served as a lead author for the second and third US national climate assessments She's conducted climate impact assessments for a broad cross-section of organizations, cities, and regions from Boston Logan Airport to the state of California. Her work has resulted in over 120 peer-reviewed publications that evaluate global climate model performance, develop and compare downscaling approaches, and quantify the impacts of climate change on cities, states, ecosystems, and sectors over the coming century. In 2012, Dr. Keho was named by Christianity Today as one of the 50 women to watch, and she's appeared on Time Magazine's list of 100 most influential people. Catherine may be best known to many of you because of how she's bridging the gap between scientists and Christians, work she does in part because she is a Christian herself. Together with her husband, Andrew Farley, a professor of applied linguistics, a pastor, and a best-selling author, Catherine wrote a book uh, called A Climate for Change, Global Warming Facts for Faith-Based Decisions. This is a book that's coming out in a new edition soon, and it tackles many of the long-held misconceptions about global warming. Catherine is currently serving as a lead author for the upcoming fourth National Climate Assessment and she's producing the second season of her PBS Digital Studios short series called Global Weirding, Climate, Politics, and Religion. We are so pleased to have you here, Catherine, and we are eager to hear what you have to share with us. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine Hayes? Thank you so much for that introduction. It's great to be back here today. I was here, was it two years ago? I did a chapel service. Was anybody else here for that? OK, a couple of hands. Great. So this is going to be different. This is not going to be the chapel service that you saw. But on my website, I, I archive a lot of my talks as well as my interviews and things that I write. So if you're interested in more, you can always find my website, which is just my name, katherinehayhoe.com. Before I get into talking about climate change, I want to start with something which you might not expect. One of the most frequent questions that I get when I'm talking to somebody else, um, a newcomer at church who just found out what I do, or somebody who I, you know, I'm traveling and I meet them and I tell them what I do, one of the first questions I get is, do you believe in climate change? <laughs> and my answer to them is, no, I don't believe in climate change. And then, usually there's kind of a confused look. It's like, but didn't you just tell me that you're a climate scientist? And then it gives me an opportunity to talk about the difference between science, which as Google defines it, is the systematic study of the physical and natural world through observing and experimenting, so looking at and handling, versus faith, which is a strong belief that is based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. Now you may say, well, this is the Google definition. That's OK. We have a biblical definition, too. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of what we do not see. So if I w had access to a time machine, one of the first things I would like to do is I'd like to go back about 2,000 years, find out who actually wrote Hebrews, and then as they were writing this, I'd like to just kind of jog their elbow and be like, hey, you know, don't forget the second half of the verse. The second half of the, ver half of the verse is clearly now science is the substance of things here and now, the evidence of things that we can't observe. So when people ask me, do you believe in global warming, my answer is no, I do not believe in global warming any more than this horse believed in gravity. 
This is a painting, it's not a real photograph. <laughs> no animals were harmed <laughs> in the making of this. But the point is, is that belief is something that through the grace of God, we have the freedom to choose. We are given the freedom to choose whether we want to accept Christ's sacrifice or not, whether we want to accept the gifts that God give us, gives us. He does that because he doesn't want a bunch of robots. He wants people who actually interact with and choose actively to be part of his family, of his body, of the church. But we don't choose whether gravity is real or not. Imagine if you said, I don't believe in gravity, and you step off the cliff, you're still going down. And so when we hear people in the media every day saying, I believe or I don't believe in climate change, it's as if it's somehow something that they can choose. And by saying, well, I don't believe in it, then, you know, it isn't true. The temperature of the planet can't be warming. Not only that, but there's also something a little bit more insidious to that word. And that's the fact that climate change is often portrayed as an alternate earth-worshipping religion. Anybody heard that one before? Don't be shy, only a few people, seriously? Okay, you can come read my email. <laughs> I get it about two or three times a week. Why is it portrayed as an earth-worshipping religion? Because for those of us who already have a belief system that we have no intention of changing, we will reject false prophets, we will reject false religions, we will reject anything that suggests that we are worshiping the created rather than the creator. And so people very cleverly frame it as a religion because they know that that will make us reject it if we already believe in God. The reality is, of course, is that faith and science are not in competition. They're not two alternate systems of belief that are mutually exclusive. And in fact, think about this for a minute. If we believe that God created this universe, and that is what we believe, then what is science other than trying to figure out how God set the whole thing up and put it together in the first place? How could studying something that God created be in conflict with the identity of God himself? Doesn't make sense. Now I understand, as a scientist, I have plenty of examples of how it appears that faith and science are in conflict. But if we start not from the premise that they should be in conflict, but if we start from the premise that they should not be in conflict, then often we can recognize, well, maybe we don't fully understand a certain aspect of science, or maybe we are too narrowly interpreting a certain aspect of the Bible. And with a little more understanding and patience and humility, sometimes we can actually work out these perceived disagreements. And in some cases, I feel like we, you know, by the time we get to heaven, maybe then we'll figure out, aha, that's what God meant when he did that or said that. But we're starting from a very different place, one that we believe that they are fundamentally compatible with each other because they originate from the same source. Not only that, but when it comes to really difficult issues of science that have moral or ethical ramifications or implications, I would argue that it isn't just a case of faith and science not being in competition with each other, it's a case of we need faith and science together to tackle these issues. As one person once said, I can't take credit for this, but I really love this, this analogy. He said, science is like a map. It will tell you which way is north and south, east or west. But what's the right way to go? Our faith is the compass that tells us how to use that map to go in the right direction. So I'm a climate scientist. I study climate change. And there's lots of empty seats right here and over here as well. Um, Go ahead and take a seat. It's going to be a while. You really don't want to stand for 45 minutes. Trust me on that one. There's tons of seats over here, and you can kind of sneak out the back of that way if you need to leave. <laughs> kind of like church, right? Everybody leaves the first couple of rows empty. I'm the pastor's wife, and I don't even like sitting in the front row. So I'm a climate scientist. So what I want to do is I want to talk a lot about the science with you. But as I talk about the science, I want you to also be thinking about the implications of the science. What does that mean for us, for who we are, for what we care about? But starting with the science, I want to start with a very natural question. Why does climate change matter? Because when we're talking about the change in the average temperature of the planet, there's some great seats right here up at the front. 
When we're talking about the, everybody come on up, it's gonna be a long time. <laughs> Tons of great seats right here, like eight seats. Um, if you're on the floor over there, you're welcome to come too, no worries. Right over here. Why does climate change matter? Because we're talking about an increase in the average temperature of the entire planet of about, so far, one, soon two degrees Celsius, three and a half degrees Fahrenheit, and there is a bigger difference between the temperature of this room and the temperature immediately outside this room than we're talking about the change in the temperature of the entire planet. So why does that little tiny change, apparently little tiny change, matter? Part of it has to do with our brains. Our brains are not built to add up the temperature on every single day of the year for at least 20 to 30 years, because that's what climate is, the average of weather over at least 20 to 30 years, and then add in weather stations from all around the entire world, and then somehow fit a trend line to that. So part of it is our brains are really good at remembering a really hot day, a very cold day, an ice storm, a snowstorm, a heat wave, a flood. That's what our brains remember. But our brains are not built to look at the long-term change in climate over 20 to 30 years. The other thing we don't realize is that, they, that even though it can be hot and cold, temperature can go up and down like a yo-yo, over climate time scales, at least 20 to 30 years, the average temperature of our planet is as stable as that of the human body. Think about your own body temperature. When you are well, your body temperature goes up and down over the course of a day by how much? A few tenths of a degree. But you might say, but my body temperature is so warm, 98 degrees, right? How many degrees does it take to run a fever? Just a few. If your body temperature goes up by two or three or four degrees Fahrenheit, you're running a fever. Somebody might say, but you're already 98 degrees. Yeah, but it doesn't matter how much you start with. It matters how, how, how big the change is. So our planet's temperature is as stable as that of the human body. And when it goes up by two or three or four degrees Fahrenheit, it is running a fever that is just as serious as the fever that our own body would be running. That's why it matters. So we know that historically, we have climate extremes all the time. Heat waves are nothing new. This is a picture of the heat wave in the summer of 1936. We know that droughts are nothing new. This is a picture of the Dust Bowl, where I live in the South Central United States. We also know hurricanes are absolutely nothing new. This is a picture of the destruction after the Galveston hurricane in 1900. We know that these types of events are part of the natural climate system, but over climate time scales, over the course of human civilization on this planet, climate has been remarkably stable. The long-term average over 20 to 30 years is very predictable. And we use this long-term average in ways that you don't think about. Let me give you some suggestions. Where do you think our building codes come from? Why are building codes in Santa Barbara different than building codes in Caribou, Maine? The climate. How do we know where we grow our crops? Why do you grow avocados in California and not in Minnesota? <laughs> climate. How do we draw our flood zones? By looking backwards at where it used to flood, climate. How do we plan for the future with our water? Looking at the water resources we need, how we've used them historically, how much it rains in a certain place, how quickly the reservoirs refill. Climate. What type of clothes do you have in your wardrobe? Climate. I'm from Canada. When I moved to Texas, I had a lot of socks and a lot of sweaters. Now, I have about two sweaters and five pairs of socks. My favorite thing about living in Texas is you really don't have to wear socks most of the time. Climate affects almost every part of our lives and we don't think about it. And again, over the course of human civilization on this planet, we haven't had to think about it because climate's been very stable. The best way to think about it is like driving down one of our dead straight roads in West Texas. 
In West Texas, we do not have any mountains. It is one of the flattest places you can imagine, but we do have upside down mountains, canyons. The second biggest canyon in the entire United States is just off the top part of this map. Did you know that? Everybody knows the Grand Canyon is the biggest. Palo Duro Canyon in North Texas is actually the second biggest. So if you were driving up I-27 on your way to Palo Duro Canyon, you'd be driving up a road that is so straight that you could go 30 seconds, two minutes, even possibly five minutes down that road, driving along looking in the rear view mirror. Why? Because where you were in the past is a perfect predictor of the future, and that is the way we humans have been living for thousands of years. Again, where do we get our building codes, our flood zones, what type of crops we grow where from the historical data? So looking backwards works great when the road is straight and when climate is not changing, but just before you get to Plainview, Texas, if you can look at the little orange line on the top of that map, there is one giant curve in the road. <laughs> not only that, but on that curve, there's a row of concrete grain silos. So what is happening if you drive up the road looking in the rear view mirror using the past as a guide to the future? Yes, I'm glad to see one person knows the answer to that. <laughs> Planning for the future based on the past is like driving down the road looking in the rear view mirror. It works great when the road is straight and when climate is stable. But if climate is changing, and even worse, if our variability is changing, if the lane sizes are going like this at the same time as you're going around a curve, we're gonna end up somewhere that we didn't plan to be. And that is why we care about a changing climate. Isn't that interesting? It's probably not some reason that you thought of before. We care about it because every single aspect of human society on this planet that has a physical component to it, our food, our water, our homes, our economy, our energy, all of that is built on the assumption that the road is straight. If it isn't straight anymore, we are going to have problems unless we start accounting for that curve in the road. So the reason that we care is twofold. First of all, we care because the road is curving. And second of all, we care, though, because the variability is changing. Now, this is a map of all of the disasters that have happened since 1980 around the United States that have caused at least a billion dollars worth of damage. So if you had a massive hurricane but it didn't make landfall, it's not on this map. This map is simply a count of how many events have happened since 1980 that caused at least a billion dollars worth of damage. And I'm not proud to say Texas is number one. Texas is the most vulnerable state in the country to very expensive disasters. Why? Because First of all, it gets every type of disaster you can imagine. We do get ice storms and blizzards in Texas, as well as heat waves, droughts, dust storms, tornadoes, haboobs, hurricanes, and pretty much everything else. But there's also a ton of people, very expensive infrastructure, extremely large cities, many of them in direct harm's way from hurricanes. Why do we care about a changing climate? Because it's taking those natural risks that have always existed and it's exacerbating them, it's making them worse, it's supercharging them. The way I think about it is like a pair of dice. We always have a chance of rolling a double six. What is a double six? A really strong drought, like California had this last decade. A crazy wildfire season. A record-breaking flood, a heat wave. We always have that chance. But what climate change is doing, decade by decade, is it's sneaking in and taking one of those other numbers and replacing it with a six also. So all of a sudden, your chances of rolling a double six are going up, and then all of a sudden, one year, you roll a double seven. And you think, what is this? Where did the double seven come from? We care about a changing climate, not because it creates new problems we've never seen before. We care about it because it takes all the problems we already have, and it is amplifying them or making them worse. Look at heat waves. Heat waves are normal in the summer, but heat waves are getting stronger and breaking more records because as our average temperature increases, when you get super high temperatures on top of that, they're even greater than they were before. Droughts are a normal part of life in California. Tree ring records going back thousands of years show mega droughts here in California before human habitation. But we also know that the recent California drought 
the one that happened over the last seven or eight years, we know that it was longer and stronger because it was so hot. So that drought would not have been as bad as it was. It would have been a double five, and actually it turned out to be a double seven. Floods. We know that the warmer air is, the more water vapor it holds. And so when a storm system comes along, as it always does, there's more water vapor in a warmer world for it to sweep up and dump on us. Wildfires. Did you know, let me just show you these headlines, did you know that December 2017, California broke the record for the largest wildfire ever, and then in August broke the record again for the largest wildfire ever. And of course, everybody probably knows that the largest wildfire ever just occurred again. Now, wildfires are a normal part of the ecosystem in Southern California. But we also know, and this is part of the National Climate Assessment that I co-authored, we also know that the total area burned by wildfires is now approximately double what it would be if it weren't for a changing climate. So the yellow here is how much area would be burned by wildfires without a changing climate, and then the orange is the extra on top of it. So you can think of it kind of like a baseball player, right? Like a really good baseball player can hit a decent amount of home runs, and then they start taking steroids. Which home run was the steroids and which was just the baseball player? You can't tell, but if you look at their statistics year after year, you're like, ooh, that line is heading up for some reason. That's what we're doing. We're putting our weather system on steroids. And of course, it's not just wildfires. We're setting record-breaking heat waves. Ten years ago, I actually published a study with a colleague at UC Berkeley talking about how increased risk of heat waves in the summer could lead to power outages in the Southern California power grid. We published that study ten years ago, and then this summer what we actually predicted would happen happened. Why? Because when it gets super hot, everybody cranks the air conditioning, and it overloads the power grid. Why? Because we built the power grid based on what? Historical data. We also know, again, droughts are getting worse. Droughts are normal and natural, but they're getting stronger and longer. And atmospheric rivers. Who here has heard of atmospheric rivers? Have you heard of atmospheric rivers? OK, a fair amount of people. Atmospheric rivers are very cool. They're actually the way that California gets almost half of its waters. They are narrow ribbons of really concentrated water vapor in the sky, like an atmospheric river. But when they hit land and that air starts to rise, they just dump the water like a rain bomb. Their natural part of life on the West Coast, they hit the whole coast all the way up to British Columbia. But in a warmer world, the air holds more water vapor. So as those atmospheric rivers track across the Pacific, there's a lot more water vapor for them to sweep up and train, bring across and dump than there used to be. It isn't just in California. I live in Texas. I live about eight hours away from Houston, but everybody has connections across the, straight states, across the state, so I knew many people who lived in the area. When we crunched the numbers on Hurricane Harvey, you know what we found? If that same hurricane had happened 100 years ago in a cooler world with less water vapor in the atmosphere for it to sweep up, there would have been 40% less rainfall. Now, some places received almost 50 inches of rainfall, so we're talking 20 less inches. You know how much that is in damages? That's a lot. In the Midwest, they're seeing massive increases in heavy precipitation to the extent where a few years ago, Farmers Insurance sued Cook County and the city of Chicago for failing to adequately update their infrastructure to account for a changing climate. What was the infrastructure based on? Exactly. And so the, the farmers insurance sued. They said to make the point that you guys got to update. Then Noah found that nuisance or sunny day flooding, so not flooding associated with a storm, just sunny day flooding is increasing significantly. On all three U.S. coasts, it's increased, okay, get these numbers, between three to almost 10 times. So 300 to 925% since the 1960s. 
And it could happen almost every other day by late this century. What does sunny day flooding look like? It looks like this. There's pictures of octopuses swimming around in parking garages in South Miami today. I mean, not literally today, but I mean, you know, last year. Why? Because we built our cities based on what? Exactly. We assumed that sea level would be constant. Now, here's the thing. If all of this were happening a thousand years ago, how many people would be living in southern Florida a thousand years ago? Maybe a few hundred people. Would they be living in giant concrete skyscrapers? No, they'd be living in very flexible, portable dwellings. So if sea level rose one or two or three or four feet in southern Florida, what would the people a thousand years ago have done? Picked it up and moved. If you're living somewhere where there's a serious drought where you could no longer gather, hunter gather the crops or the animals that you ate, what would you do? Many people, not everybody, but many people in the past would have been able to pick up and move. Why can't we do that anymore? Because we have seven and a half billion people and because we live in hard infrastructure that we cannot pick up and move. So that's why I think some of the really interesting innovations, and we'll get there later, but some of the really interesting innovations are the fact that in the Netherlands, where of course sea level rise is a very big concern, they're building floating villages. So what happens if sea level goes up one or two or three feet? You get a few more feet of anchor chain, who cares? It's genius. So they're actually building for a changing climate so that as it changes, they are gonna be okay. But we live in a world today where the Prime Minister of Dominica, which was one of the islands that was just wiped out by the hurricane season last year. Now, just a second here. Hurricanes are not getting more frequent. We had a really bad year last year, but we have okay years in between. We're not seeing more frequent hurricanes, but we, what we are seeing is the hurricanes have more rain associated with them. They are intensifying faster because they get their energy from warm ocean water. They're stronger, they're bigger, and they're moving more slowly. So we're not seeing any more frequent hurricanes than we used to, but we are seeing that the ones we get are stronger. They're on steroids. As a result, a new poll just came out this week. The Yale Program on Climate Communication has been tracking public opinion on climate change for over a decade. A new poll came out just this week showing that this last year, there has been the biggest increase in awareness of people across the United States that, man, this thing is actually serious. And they asked me why, and what I said is, I think it has something to do with the fact that this is not about the polar bears anymore. This is something that's affecting us in the places where we live. We know that droughts and floods and storms and wildfires are natural, but we also know that these things are starting to get a little crazier than we thought. Um, one of my cousins lives just north of San Francisco in Santa Rosa. He lost his house a year and a half ago. They were sitting there in the house thinking, you know, it's far away. We live in a suburban neighborhood. We don't even have any trees. Surely we'll be fine. So they were staying up at night just to make sure because there was no warning system. There was no alarm. There was nothing they could do other than just, you know, talk to the neighbors and look out the door. And at two in the morning, my cousin said, you know, I think I'll go to bed. I have to wake up early tomorrow. And his wife said, well, let's just stay up a few more minutes and make sure. She looked out in the back. She started to see some sparks fall. Then they got a call that the fire had jumped the highway and was three blocks away from their house. So she said, well, you know, I mean, I don't think it's really going to get us, but I think we should be safe. So at 2.09, they woke up their kids. They got them in the car. She grabbed the photo albums and a bag of apples. They drove off down their street and half an hour later, the house was burned to the ground. So these things are happening. But yet, at the same time, I'm sure there's a few of you in this room who are thinking this, and I know there's a lot of people out there who are. At the same time, you're thinking, are you really sure about this, Catherine? Because when we turn on the news, or we listen to people talking, or if you just look at my social media feed, every single day, someone will say to me, it's just a natural cycle. Or, you scientists, you haven't studied this long enough to really be sure about this. Or, of course, my favorite, you're just making this whole thing up to line your pockets. Because we all know you get these million dollar grants from the government that go straight into the Swiss bank account. <laughs> just to be clear, they don't. Or people even say things like, no, actually, sea level's going down, it's not going up. Or, of course, it's such a tiny bit of carbon dioxide you're talking about that's causing this problem. And my answer, of course, is this is just a tiny bit of arsenic I put in your water bottle. 
Or, of course, my favorite, it's cold outside. <laughs> and people ask me every day, as this guy did yesterday, perhaps Miss Climate Genius can explain how we had an ice age despite zero human interference or emissions that were contributing to that climate event. And my response, of course, was, it's Mrs. Climate Genius, thank you very much. <laughs> But in all, no, that was actually not my response. <laughs> in all seriousness, though, we've known about this for a really long time. So I'm going to give you a little quiz. No grading. Anonymous. How old is climate science? Is it about 50 years old? Is it about 200 years old? Is it since a very famous climate scientist, Jim Hansen, first testified to Congress in 1988? Or was it invented by Al Gore? <laughs> you know what the real answer is? The real answer is B. A couple of you got this. OK, isn't this crazy? 200 years? That's pretty old. We've been studying this for a long time. Fourier, who was a very famous mathematician, was the first person to notice when he went to Egypt with Napoleon. There's a lot of interesting history here. He noticed that people who wore dark coats got a lot hotter than people who wore light coats. And that made him realize that the reflectivity of a surface determined its temperature. So then he started to apply that to the Earth. I'm telling you, people had a lot of time on their hands back then. They did amazing things. He started to apply that to the Earth, and he realized the Earth, according to its reflectivity and how much energy it was getting from the sun, the Earth should be 60 degrees Fahrenheit colder than it is in real life. So we thought, well, why isn't it? Because I understand the basic physics. And he realized it's got to be because of our atmosphere. Our atmosphere acts like a blanket. How does a blanket keep you warm? Now, don't get smart out and tell me you plug it into the wall. <laughs> electric blankets used to be a thing back then, but we don't. Who here has an electric blanket? OK, OK, all right. <laughs> In Canada, we do have a few electric blankets still, too. All right. Elect I'm leaving aside the electric ones, how does a regular blanket keep you warm? It traps your body heat, right? Under the blanket. That's what our atmosphere does. It traps the Earth's heat, preventing it from escaping to space, keeping us 60 degrees warmer than we should be. By the 1850s, John Tyndall, a British scientist, had discovered specifically which gases it was. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane. Don't worry, this is the only chemistry you're going to see. You may be thinking I didn't sign up for a chemistry lecture. That's OK. These gases are present in our atmosphere in trace amounts, but they're very important because we all know it's the potency that matters, not the amount. When you're sick, do you go to the doctor, and does the doctor give you a pill that is the size of your body? No. To poison somebody, do you need the, volume, you know, the amount of poison that they weigh? No. It's the potency that matters. And John Tyndale in the 1850s figured out that these gases are very potent gases. And get this, he even figured out that digging up and burning coal and gas and oil is actually producing more of these gases, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. He knew that in the 1850s. Why does this matter? It matters because, if we can play this, it matters because our planet already has, there we go, there's our happy planet, it already has a natural blanket of heat trapping gases. So the sun's energy shines down and actually goes through most of this blanket like a window, and then the earth heats up and gives off heat energy, but the heat energy is what's trapped by the blanket. It is 100% natural, and it is 100% necessary for life. We would be a frozen ball of ice if it weren't for this amazing blanket. So if it's good and it's natural, what's the problem? The problem is, is that by digging up and burning coal and gas and oil, we are putting more of these heat-trapping gases into the atmosphere that are wrapping an extra blanket around our planet that it does not need. It's trapping too much heat. <laughs> Just like if you're sleeping at your grandma's house and she sneaks in at night like mine always used to and puts an extra blanket on you and you wake up sweating saying, Grandma, I didn't need that. In the same way, our planet is heating up and it's all because of this extra blanket. Did you ever imagine you could explain climate change in one 30 or 60 second cartoon? Yeah. So we've known for more than 100 years that trace gases in the atmosphere are the thermostat of the planet 
Burning coal and gas and oil produces more of these gases, and that's the main reason why the planet's warming. It isn't just that, though. We also look at the usual suspects. Could it be the sun? Because the sun has caused the planet to warm and cool in the past. Well, this is the average temperature of our planet. It goes up and down from year to year, but decade by decade by decade, it's getting warmer. If we were getting warmer because of the sun, would we have to be getting more energy from the sun or less? Give me your fingers. Vote. To be getting warmer because of the sun, would we be getting less energy or more energy? All right, most of you have the correct answer. The correct answer is more because like a dimmer switch on a light, when you turn up the dimmer switch, it gives off more light, right? So here's the, en the energy from the sun. It goes up and down in an 11-year cycle that was discovered by Galileo. These people knew so much so long ago. Did you know the ancient Greeks more than 2,000 years ago, they knew the earth was round, they calculated the distance to the sun and the diameter of the earth. Just a little side note. People had the same brains back then. They were just as smart. The sun's energy has been going down, so according to the sun, we should be getting cooler right now, not warmer. Well, could it just be a natural cycle? Natural cycles, like El Nino, operate like a teeter-totter or a seesaw. They can't create heat because that would violate conservation of energy. What they do is they move heat around the climate system back and forth from the ocean to the atmosphere and back again. So during an El Nino, it's warmer up top, that extra heat came from the ocean. During a La Nina, we tend to have a cooler year, the extra heat's going back into the ocean. So if our air temperature were warming because of a natural cycle, that heat would have to be coming from somewhere. The heat content of the atmosphere would be going up, but the heat content of the ocean would have to be going down by an equal and opposite amount. That's how we know it's a natural cycle. So let's look at the data. If you look at the data, the green here is the change in the heat content of the atmosphere and the land and the ice all put together. And the heat content of the ocean isn't equal and opposite. It's the same direction and 20 times bigger. There's 20 times more heat going into the ocean than the atmosphere and land and ice put together. And people say, well, why aren't we talking about that? I mean, we're talking about 250 exajoules. <laughs> I know, it's like six Hiroshima bombs a second, something like that. It's crazy. The answer is simply we're not dolphins. If we were dolphins, we'd be like, people, who cares what's happening up there? Look at what's happening down here. So it can't be a natural cycle because it would violate conservation of energy. But there's one more type of natural cycle, and that one is caused by changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun. Over time, our orbit gets more elliptical and then more circular, and the axis of rotation also precesses like a top. If you've ever spun a top, you know that it spins really quickly, but it also slowly moves around like this, right? Our Earth does the same thing, and that changes how sunlight falls on the Earth, and that is responsible for the ice ages and the warm period like we're in today. So people often say, well, isn't it just getting warmer after the last ice age? Well, let's look at temperature over the history of human civilization on this planet. The answer is no. The warming after the last ice age peaked about 6,000 years ago, and since then we were on a long, slow slide into another ice age, which I don't know about you, but we do not want that in Canada because there would be no Canada left, except a small part of the Yukon, which miraculously was ice-free. Isn't that crazy? We were on a long, slow slide into the next ice age until something happened. So it can't be the sun because we'd be getting cooler. It can't be natural cycles because the whole planet's warming. It can't be the Earth's orbit because the next thing coming according to that natural cycle was another ice age, but we've indefinitely delayed that. Don't worry about that. We're heading very fast in the opposite direction. Now, over the last 200 years, there have been <coughs> thousands of scientific studies published. Thousands. Showing that, yes, the planet is warming, Yes, the heat is accumulating in the ocean too. Yes, humans are responsible. It's not the sun, it's not cosmic rays, it's not a natural cycle, it's not volcanoes. In fact, volcanic, volcanic eruptions actually cool the earth, they don't warm it. But over the last 10 years, there have been a handful of studies published that say the earth isn't warming that fast, or it probably is just a natural cycle, or you know, it might be the sun. So two years ago, we took 38 of those studies. There's about 50 or so of them. We took 38. And we recalculated every single one from scratch. A 
thankless task. I mean, imagine if you had to recalculate every single problem set in your class from scratch that everybody else did. We did it. And what we found in every single one of those studies was an error. In some cases, it was mathematical. In other cases, they left out an important factor that you can't leave out. In other cases, they made an assumption that was incorrect. In another case, they might have used an analysis method that was invalid. In some cases, the conclusions they drew didn't even match the results. But in every single case, we found an error that if that error was corrected, it brought that study directly in line with the tens of thousands of other studies that have been published in the last 200 years, saying that it's real, it's us, and it's serious. Isn't that telling? So going back to the question that I asked, are you really sure about this, Catherine? The answer is yes, we're, we're about as sure as a scientist can be. And if you're interested in learning more about that, I want to leave you with a, a resource before we move on to talk about what we can do about it. I have these little YouTube videos called Global Weirding. They're pretty short, five or six minutes each. They're not all cartoons, like there's some cartoon that's mostly me talking. And they answer frequently asked questions like, how do you know it's not a natural cycle? What does the Bible say about climate change? Nothing, the Bible was written way before, but it's got a lot of other good stuff in it that talks about our attitudes. Um, aren't you scientists just in it for the money? Um, you know, could you just talk to you know, my Uncle Joe and explain this to him because I'm sure you could change his mind. And the answer is I don't think I could depending on who Uncle Joe is. And then the latest ones we've been doing, these are the latest ones right here. We have a new one coming out every two weeks. The latest ones talk about what it means for the places where we live. And the most recent one you can see right here is actually from my region, the Southern Great Plains, and your region, the Southwest US. So check out these super short videos if you want more information. But now I wanna move on to the third most important question, which is what are we supposed to do about this? This really is the question, right? Because if it's a natural cycle, what do we do about it? We adapt. But it isn't just a natural cycle. We're the ones driving it. So John Holdren, who is the former president's science advisor, said something which I think is completely true. He said, we have three choices here. We can mitigate. What is mitigation? Mitigation is reducing what we are doing that is contributing to the problem. The main thing we are doing is digging up and burning coal and gas and oil. The second main thing we are doing that's about three quarters of the problem. The remaining quarter of the problem is land use and agriculture, deforestation, animal agriculture. You know how many heat trapping gases cows belch every day? Massive amounts, far more than your family members or your roommates. <laughs> so mitigation is reducing our contribution to the problem. Adaptation is preparing for a different future. And what's suffering? We know what suffering is. It's not a very sciencey word, but we know what suffering is. We're going to do some of each. The question is what the mix will be, because the more mitigation we do, the less adaptation is required and the less suffering there will be. So I want to take a look at what these things look like. And one of the places that I've worked, I work with a lot of cities, I've worked in the city of Chicago. So what does adaptation look like in the city of Chicago? And if you remember, I already brought up Chicago earlier, they were the ones who were sued. And I'm very sorry to say that the city of Chicago could not plead ignorance because four years before this, we had done a study for the city showing how much heavy rainfall was increasing. Oops. <laughs> no, it was good that they knew and they were able to make significant plans. So. What we did working with the city is we first of all worked with them to identify the risks. What's happening in Chicago? One of the things Chicago cares a lot about is flooding. They also care about the fact that they have crazy potholes. They have a big transportation system that when it gets too hot, the rails warp and they have to shut down the trains. And they also have a very economically segregated city where in the south side of Chicago, there's hardly any green space. People cannot afford to pay their air conditioning bills. They don't want to open the windows at night because they're afraid somebody might break in, but it's hot. So when the thermometer p spikes in southern Chicago, the emergency calls go through the roof. So we worked with the city of Chicago, and we looked at 
when they should replace the rails with more heat-resistant material, how they could help reduce the urban heat island effect in South Chicago so when the heat waves came, people wouldn't be as impacted by it. And yes, Chicago also started to do a lot. New sewers to dispatch heavy rains, massive new reservoir to help alleviate flooding. Taking the urban heat island, which cities are always you know, warmer than the surrounding area, you know, LA versus outside LA, and putting in green roofs. Isn't that cool? So Chicago's plan is actually to reduce the urban heat island effect by the same amount that climate change is pushing up their average temperature. That's a pretty big adaptation, isn't it? But they wouldn't have been able to do it if they didn't look forward, see the curve in the road, get us to characterize the curve, how soon it was coming up, how steep it was, and then they could make the plans to prepare for the curve. So that's what they're doing. And they're not the only ones. We're working with DC, Austin, state of California has been doing this for 15 years already. There's a lot of different places that are looking down the road, looking at the curve. So that's an example of what adaptation looks like. What does mitigation look like? I picked an unexpected place to talk about mitigation. <laughs> Texas is well known for having the most carbon dioxide emissions of any state, even more than California. I know they're the same color on this map, but Texas is substantially more than California. But in Texas, they have more wind energy than any other state. It's up to 19.5% almost of their electricity from wind last year. There's the biggest army base in the whole US is of course in Texas. Everything's uh -huh. bigger in Texas. They went with wind and solar energy last year because it was cheaper. They would save taxpayers over $165 million compared to natural gas. That's what mitigation looks like. Our wind energy increase is increasing. We're up to a total, 2017 was a very windy year, the first half of the year. We're up to 19% total for 2018. And there's entire towns going green. Well, that's Texas, you might say. What about China? Because we all know, right, what China looks like. China is famous for its air pollution. Living in Beijing would shorten your life by five years because the air pollution was so bad. They burn a ton of coal in China, but they know it. And so because of that, they are investing so much in wind and solar energy that they have more installed than any other country in the world. And they've already shut down all the coal-fired plants around Beijing. They haven't shut them all down, not at all. They're taking some of the coal they're not using it, selling it to other countries. But they're moving in this direction. And over the past three years, they've been investing $360 billion. That's a lot of money. What does mitigation look like in other places? Well, for some people, it could look like solar shingles on the roof. For others, it might look like a panel on a thatched roof hut. For some people, it might look like a plug-in car. For other people, it might look like light bulbs. <coughs> There's a huge variety of adaptation. And one of my favorite resources is this project called Project Drawdown. Have you heard of Project Drawdown? A few people have. If you look online, it's at drawdown.org. And they have a list of 100 different silver buckshot, so to speak. You know, there's no one silver bullet, but there's silver buckshot. They have a list of 100 different solutions to climate change, and some of them might surprise you. You know what? So number, number two is wind turbines. OK. You know what number three is? Reducing food waste, because we throw out a third of the food we grow. That's a pretty important thing that we can do. And what does reducing food waste help with? Hunger, because it, has, it gives food to other people. Number six is the education of women and girls in developing countries because it brings down the infant mortality rate, which brings down the birth rate, which allows them to actually choose how many children they want to have rather than having like some number arbitrarily imposed on them like in China. And it helps them grow and invest and run small businesses and have a much healthier and better life. There are a ton, I think in the top 40, there's like 20 of the solutions have to do with land use putting carbon from the air back into the soil where it's good. Carbon in the soil is like miracle grow on steroids. You can do it through regenerative agriculture, through biochar where you burn agricultural residue at high temperature and then you plow it back into the ground like they've been doing in the Amazon for hundreds of years. It's not new, it's not rocket science. There's managed grazing strategies with livestock that can actually put carbon back in the ground rather than taking it out. There's reforestation, there's clean cook stove projects so people don't have to cut down trees to cook their food and it reduces the air, indoor air pollution that kills 
millions of people around the world every year. There are amazing mitigation strategies and really encouraging ones. But I want to finish this quote, though, by asking, well, what does suffering look like? Because when we look at who is most affected by a changing climate, it's people who live in places where they don't have the options we do. Places where these are the people most vulnerable to a changing climate, these are the, peop- the percentage of those places that already live in poverty, where they don't have enough to eat. They live on less than $2 a day. Every penny they have is spent on essential goods. So whether we live in North America or Southeast Asia, heavy rainfall is increasing, but they are disproportionately affected. They don't have flood insurance. They don't have the National Guard. They don't have home insurance. They don't have you know, a bank account to help them out. Whether we live in Texas or whether we live in Syria, we're impacted by increasing drought. But in Syria, you can't dig another, a new well to get groundwater unless you have a permit. You can't get a permit unless you grease somebody's palm. So in Texas, people have the water rights. They can sink a, sink a well. They can get more water to help them through the tough times. They have crop insurance. They have bank accounts that have balances in them. Whether we live on the coasts, whether we live in the interior where heat waves are increasing, wherever we live, we care about a changing climate because a changing climate is the hole in the bucket. It isn't a one or two degree change in the temperature of the planet that matters. It's the fact that it exacerbates what? Hunger, poverty, disease, lack of access to clean water, resource shortages that drive unemployment, that drive civil conflict that drive political conflict, that drive refugee crises. Climate change interacts with and exacerbates all of these issues. And so we have three choices. And we have to do some of each. And the bottom line is there's a curve in the road and we want to plan for that curve in the road because we want to save future for every single one of us who lives on this planet. So often we feel like to care about climate change, we have to be what? We have to be green. We have to be a tree hugger have to vote left, maybe even communist, (laughs) have to worship the earth. We have this whole litany of things you have to be to care, but think about this for a second. Where does the air you breathe come from? Where does the water you drink? Where does the food you eat? Where does every single material that you are wearing, that you are sitting on, that is in this building that you use in your life come from? It doesn't come from outer space. It comes from this planet. So to care about a changing climate, we only have to be one thing, and that is a human. And most of us are humans, right? Living on this planet. If you're planning on moving to Mars, that's okay. Go ahead and move to Mars. But as uh, Martin Rees, who's the Royal Astronomer of England, said, we were backstage together last year for an event, and I said to him, Martin, do you really agree with things like people like Stephen Hawking are saying, who had just spoken pre- the previous day? He said, do you really agree with Stephen Hawking when he says, that you know, we might have to terraform Mars to escape from climate change? And Martin Rees looked at me and said, oh no, he said, terraforming or fixing climate change is a dawdle in the park compared to terraforming Mars. <laughs> we really need to do this just for us. So to return to this question for just a few more minutes, what can we do about it? What can we? I'm not the city of Chicago. I'm not the state of California. I don't run Tesla. What can we as individuals do about it? The most important thing you can do might surprise you. It has nothing to do with light bulbs or recycling. The most important thing we can do about it is talk about it. And this is what I talk about in my TED Talk. It just came out three weeks ago. And they asked me, well, what do you want to talk about? And I said, I think I should talk about the most important thing we can do about climate change, which is talk about it. (laughs) Because when they surveyed people across the United States, three quarters of people across the whole United States don't hear somebody else talk about climate change more than once or twice a year. So if we don't hear anybody talk about it, why would we care? If we don't care, why would we want to do anything about it? It starts with a conversation. A conversation about what? You might say, I'm not a scientist. Don't talk about the science. The science is actually the least important thing to talk about. Talk about things that we're doing ourselves. If you want more ideas, there's this great organization called climatecaretakers.org. It's an online Christian community where you sign up, and every month they send you a suggestion of what we can do together as a community, because that's the way we work. We're a body. Talk about what churches are doing. 
One of my favorite people, a guy called Colby May, graduated in business from Texas Tech. You know Colby? Okay, there you go. And then he got an MDiv, and they decided he was going to found a business to do energy audits for churches. So he goes in, and he does an energy audit, and he says, you could save 35% of your energy budget. If you, not even solar panels, if you just, you know, put in a smart thermostat and bought a new air conditioner and did this or did that. So then you have 35% of your operating budget to spend on helping people, which is what we really want to do. Or you could put solar panels on a thousand year old cathedral. It took a long time to get the permits for that, but they did it. Or you could put them in the shape of a cross. We can talk about what corporations are doing. Walmart's the richest company in the world, and they're going to be 50% clean energy by 2025. Apple's number 11, and they're 100% clean energy already. In Morocco, they've got the biggest solar farm in the world, in Morocco. In the UK, they have the biggest wind farm. In China, of course, they have more wind and solar energy than they know what to do with. They have panda-shaped solar farms. <laughs> Walt Disney has a mouse-shaped solar farm. They do. But I love talking about what's happening in unexpected places where people don't have access to coal or gas or oil. They don't have it. They live in poverty because they do not have energy. They need energy, and they have a lot of wind and sun. And so I am really excited about innovative microfinancing programs that are taking these types of energy into communities that do not have energy and are helping people increase their quality of living. We can also raise our voices by joining organizations that do, like Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. Only allowed in if you're under 30. Arash is one of my favorite organizations, and they have an, a, a chapter right here in Southern California where they do in-place conservation. MICA Challenge is about living justly in this world. The bottom line is this. All you have to be to care about climate change is what? A human. But as Christians, we have even more reason. Because if we take the Bible seriously, if that's who we are, then we know that caring about God's creation, and creation is people too, it's not just you know people over here and creation over here. Caring about God's creation, the people and other living things that are already being affected by climate change today, is a genuine expression of our faith, it is a faithful acceptance of the responsibility God has given us, and it is a true expression of God's love. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us, the only thing that counts is when our faith expresses itself through love. Thank you. So we have time for questions now. If you have to leave, I totally understand. So if you're going to leave, this is the time when you should do that. But we are going to take questions. And I also want to tell you that so every Every other week, we release a new Global Weirding episode. But the weeks in between, I do a Facebook Live Q&A. So if you like my Facebook page, it's just my name, you can join us every other Wednesday night, and you can ask questions. We usually get through about 30 or 40 questions in about half an hour. It's really fun. We have people from all over the world, actually. So much of your observations seem to be about really reducing the CO2 emission and getting the CO2 density down, which uh, stop the reabsorption in the Earth for ages. Are there activities going on to limit the incoming visible and UV spectrum energy coming in, like reflective layers or even on the Earth during the atmosphere? Yes, there absolutely are. So what he's asking about is he's asking about something called geoengineering, which is the idea of deliberately engineering our planet. We have a global weirding video on geoengineering if you want to check it out. But one of the strategies that people are proposing is something called solar radiation management. Now, I referred earlier briefly to the fact that volcanoes or volcanic eruptions cool the Earth. How do they do that? They do that because when they erupt, a really powerful eruption shoots particles up into the stratosphere where they stay for months and even a year or two. And these particles act like an umbrella that reflects the sun's energy back to space. So they temporarily cool the planet. So people have thought, well, what if we did that ourselves? What if we put particles in the upper atmosphere deliberately to reflect the sun's energy back to space? It would cool the temperature of the planet. But it would also reduce incoming solar radiation. And there's one big thing that needs solar radiation, and that is plants. So there have been massive famines after big volcanic eruptions because of the impact on so incoming solar radiation and clouds. Also, I didn't talk about this at all, but a big problem, especially in the ocean, is that the ocean is sucking up a lot of this carbon dioxide too, and it's acidifying. And the acidification is impacting the base of the food chain, especially the coral reefs, which are the nurseries of the ocean. 
And so solar radiation management would have no impact whatsoever on the disruption to the carbon cycle that's driving this. It would be like putting a, a band-aid on something as opposed to putting stitches on it. And then the third issue we have with that is nobody wants to fund the scientific research to even understand the side effects. The National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, they will not touch it with a 10-foot pole. And so what I would advocate for most strongly, especially if I was speaking to funding organizations, is pay for scientists to study this stuff because before we know it, another country like China or India or Pakistan, they have the technology to do this unilaterally. And if you do it without studying the side effects thoroughly, it is like giving an experimental drug to every human on the planet that hasn't passed the FDA tests. As a scientist, I want all the options on the table, so I want to study the heck out of this thing so that we understand if it gets bad enough, could we do it, what would the side effects be, and what would it accomplish? Because it's gotten to the point now where we need to consider all the options. So, thank you for that question. Excellent. All right, over here, yes. If I'm reading right, I think there's a lot of discussion um, and, uh, around the, the question of whether we can limit global warming to two degrees Celsius mm -hmm. over time. Um, and obviously there's a lot of assumptions that go into any calculation as to whether it can be limited. Um, if I'm understanding right, maybe you can comment on it, that in order to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius, it, it would require massive amounts of recapture of carbon dioxide, not just limiting the output of it, but actually recapturing CO2 that's actually already out there in order to, in order to limit it said conversely, right? If you don't, if you don't limit it, it's yeah. going to go past two. Do yes. you want to comment just on what, where you think the science is on that right now? Sure. So as you know, um, the Paris Agreement, um, every country in the world except the United States has agreed to lim try their best to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius or below. Now, I'd just like to note that the U.S. has not actually formally withdrawn. They can't formally withdraw until the week before the next federal election. And then, if they do withdraw, um, they could rejoin by just serving notice and rejoining within 30 days. So technically, the U.S. is actually even still part of the Paris Agreement. They just announced they're going to withdraw. So the Paris Agreement was all the countries in the world coming together and trying to quantify exactly what's dangerous. Because as scientists, we can say, if we produce this much carbon, the world will warm by X. If we produce this much, it will warm by Y. We can also say, at X degrees, here are the impacts on agriculture, food, water, energy, all that type of stuff. But we can't tell you what's dangerous because, honestly, some people are already experiencing danger. Did you know that there's climate refugees in the United States already? Native American tribes in Louisiana are having to evacuate the historical land because it's sinking and being inundated by sea level rise. So for some people, it's already dangerous. So as a scientist, I can't give you a magic number that's dangerous, but all the co countries in the world came together as policymakers and decided that around about two degrees, it's not a magic number. I mean, it's not like 1.99 is fine and 2.001, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. It's not that. But around about two degrees, we start to see many more widespread dangerous impacts around the world across economic sectors. So we as scientists can say, if we produce this much cumulative carbon, it isn't how much we produce every year, it's the cumulative amount that matters. So how much total? If we produce this much cumulative carbon, we have you know, a, a 66 or an 80 or a 90% chance of remaining below two degrees. We have not yet produced the cumulative carbon that would exceed two degrees. We're at about here, we have this much more to go. But the problem is, is it's pretty hard to decarbonize our entire society in a matter of years. I mean, we've been using this stuff since the Industrial Revolution and before that even. So that's why people are talking about not only reducing our carbon emissions as quickly as possible, but they're afraid that we would overshoot. And if we overshoot, if we act quickly to pull it back out of the atmosphere, there's this lag time in the climate system to where it doesn't care. Like if you overshoot for five or 10 or 15 years, but you suck it back out again in that time, you're gonna be okay. Gives you a little bit of a, you know, it's like you're handing in an assignment and you get like an extra grace period. The grace period of the climate system is about 20 to 30 years. So we haven't gotten to the top of that budget yet, but we think that we are probably gonna overshoot it. And that's why people are looking at options to suck it back out right now as well. And they're doing some amazing things. There's a Swiss company called Climeworks 
that has figured out how to suck carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into liquid fuel, which you would then burn in a car, or you can even burn it in an airplane without changing the engine at all, and then it would release the exact same carbon back to the atmosphere, so it would be zero carbon total, because you're just recycling it. That's pretty cool. They've also figured out how to turn it into rock, how to turn it into baking soda. We just don't need that much baking soda. <laughs> And they're trying to figure out ways to turn it into algae, because algae eat CO2, and then you can turn the algae into biofuel, and then you can power all the planes in the world off the algae biofuel. So they're doing some really cool things, and I'm super excited about it. But we have to be doing it faster, because we just aren't doing it fast enough. So, let's see. What diseases are seen to increase due to climate change? Sorry, what's the what? What diseases? Oh, diseases. Oh, OK. So one of the biggest impacts is on the spread of diseases, not the disease itself, but the carrier of the disease. So a lot of diseases are carried by mosquitoes, and the warmer it gets, the further north the mosquitoes spread. And the mosquitoes have to be alive a certain amount of time for the disease to incubate. So dengue, for example, the, the mosquito has to be alive a certain amount of time for the disease to incubate in the mosquito for it to become infectious. If it's too cold, the mosquito will get killed off before the disease incubates. But the warmer and warmer weather we have, the longer the mosquitoes will live and the more chance they have of becoming infectious with diseases like that. So mosquito and vector-borne diseases, as they call it, diseases that are also carried by rats and ticks and things, are really a concern. I grew up running through the woods of Canada every summer. I had, I had never seen a tick. My entire life, I'd never seen a tick. My husband grew up in Virginia. Every day after, in the summer, his mother would strip him down and check him for ticks. Mm -hmm. She'd pull about 10 of them off his body. We never had ticks. And so when a colleague of mine who was studying kudzu, which is an invasive species that is all over the South US but is already up over the border into Canada, when she was studying kudzu, she got bitten by a tick in the US in the process. She got Lyme disease. She went back to Canada. It took forever to diagnose it because they'd never seen Lyme disease. And then when they diagnosed it, they said, well, it's not covered by our health insurance because it's not a known disease in Canada. And she's like, but I have it and it's real. And now guess what? It is over the border and people have it in Canada because the ticks are now in Canada. So we're seeing these things happen. And it's not just um, vector-borne diseases, as they call it, diseases carried by animals and insects, also water contamination. A lot of people, I think it's something like 5 million people a year, most of those under the age of 5 die every year from contaminated water. How does that relate to climate change? Heavy rainfall is increasing. Heavy rainfall sweeps contaminants, animal waste, human waste, pollutants into the water, contaminating the water supply, leading to outbreaks of waterborne diseases. So that's where the connection is. All right, great question. Yes? Ooh, what kind of clothes do I wear when I'm in the science lab? That's a great question. <laughs> I am a total disappointment <laughs> because my lab is a giant supercomputer. If you go into my lab, you're going to see the lab is about half the size of this room and it's covered with thousands of black boxes because every box is a computer and I use about a thousand of them. And the room is really cold because the computers run and they produce a lot of heat from running. So the room is kept at like 50 degrees. So when I go into it, I wear a jacket. <laughs> but I don't go into it very much because I can access that room from my computer right here. So I can be running my, I, I have these simulations of the earth. It's almost like a video game where you have like a picture of the earth and you can do things to it to see what would happen. I run them on these computers when I'm here in California, when I'm like back home in Canada. Um, even when I went up to the Arctic, I was doing it from there. But when people come, sometimes people come with TV cameras and they want to take a picture of the lab. And I show them the lab and they're really disappointed. <laughs> And they're like, can't you put on a white coat or something? And I'm like, I don't even own a white coat. <laughs> so what some of my friends did, you know what they did? They had the same problem. So they put a giant picture of the earth. They glued a giant picture of the earth to their computers. <laughs> so that when people come with TV cameras, they can take a picture of something pretty. <laughs> so great question. I love that. Um, yes, let's see. Over here and then over here, yes. Uh, what do you think of the bipartisan energy innovation and carbon dividend act as a, a strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? 
So when we talk about fixing climate change, again, there's no silver bullet, but there's a lot of silver buckshot. And one of them is the idea that we put a price on carbon so that when we use carbon, the stuff that uses a lot of carbon is more expensive and the stuff that uses less carbon is cheaper. And then the idea is rather than letting the government keep that money, because nobody really trusts the government to keep that money and do something with it, the idea is to actually give that money back to people in their taxes like they've been doing in British Columbia now for 10 years. And British Columbia now has the lowest personal income tax rate of any uh, province in Canada. It also has the lowest corporate income tax rate of almost any place in, the, in North America. So there's a bill that's actually being considered right now in Washington that would propose doing that. And it's really interesting because what that does is it makes it cheaper for us as individuals to buy the good stuff and it makes it more expensive to buy the stuff like the super inefficient cars and how, that use a lot of gasoline or trucks, I should say, but it makes it easier for us to buy the other stuff and we get money back the less carbon we use. So that's one of the policy options that's being considered, and it's one that generally has bipartisan support. The really cool thing about this bill was it was introduced by a Republican and a Democrat together. And I don't know about you, but I don't think there's any other bill that's been introduced by one of those two together in the last few years. So that's pretty cool and pretty exciting, I think. All right, now actually, before we go over here, let me ask you, what's your question? Yeah, so if I were to post like on Twitter right now, climate change is real, it's us, and it's happening, I, I can expect not to get like the most positive response back from people I know and people I really love. Um, so in your mind, correct. As a, as a <laughs> I get that every day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. What do you think is like the the cause for conflict? I mean, why are people like why do people not want to hear this? Yes. I I get this myself um, all the time. And first of all, yes. So he says, if I post on Twitter that climate is changing, humans are responsible, and the impacts are serious, I will get a lot of grief. And I completely validate his experience because I get that grief every day. And I will say something. I will say social media is not the place to have constructive discussions. It isn't. Because you're not looking at each other eyeball to eyeball. You're not relating to each other as a human. So I don't expect that anybody's mind is going to get changed by anything I say on social media. I'm on social media to provide information to people who already want it. But I talk to people in person, or I have longer conversations with people, where we can really get into the issues and treat each other with respect and dignity, rather than, unfortunately, a lot of the conversations that happen on social media are characterized by exactly the opposite. But why is that? How do we get to the point in the United States where the number one predictor of whether you agree with that statement is not how much education you have, how much you know about science, it's simply where we fall on the political spectrum. The further we are to the right, we're more likely to reject the science of climate change. The science of climate change is 200 years old. It's based on basic thermodynamics that explains how our fridges and our stoves work. So it isn't that we really have a problem with basic thermodynamics, but what's happened is our society has become increasingly polarized. In fact, I want to show you some pictures. Luckily, I have my own computer here um, because I can pull up something else. If we look at the political landscape in the United States and how it has changed over the last 25 years, it is stunning. So this is what the landscape of the United States looked like in 1994 when the Pew Political Polarization Survey first began. People were pretty much in the middle, right? If people identified as a Republican or Democrat, the average was pretty close together. 2011, 2017, and then this is everybody. They redid this with only people who actually voted in the 2016 election. We live in an incredibly politically polarized society to the point where to belong to our tribe, whatever that tribe is, to belong to our tribe, we accept a package of values. And unfortunately, if we're conservative, which is really an anachronism, because if we're really conservative, don't we want to conserve? <laughs> but if we're conservative, part of the package of values that we've been told is that this stuff isn't real. It's a liberal Democrat issue. We've been told things like my own, our own congressman in Texas, climate change is not a science, it's a religion. Or we've been told that, uh, let's see, 
um, you know, the, the arrogance of humans to think that, that climate is changing due to human activities. Or, you know, we have a senator bringing a snowball into the floor of the Senate and saying, you know, climate change isn't real because of that. <laughs> but when you actually have a conversation with somebody, and many of us, you know, somebody might, you might be thinking that, well, I, may, I am that somebody, or you might be thinking, I know that somebody. If you have a conversation with someone, and I've had thousands of conversations, a conversation that begins with, it's just a natural cycle or God is in control, within 30 seconds will take a 90 degree turn to, I don't want the government setting my thermostat. I don't want the liberals telling me what type of car I can drive. I don't want them destroying the economy and letting China get ahead, although, you know, China is already getting ahead. <laughs> and so, Galen Carey is um, the Associate Director of the National Association of Evangelicals, and I love this quote because he hits the nail on the head. He says, many evangelicals oppose action to slow climate change, not on a religious basis, but politically, because they believe the government wants to take away their freedom. So that is why it's so important for us, I think, to go back to our values, to go back to what we actually believe. Because the reason why we care is because we are children of God, because we have God's love in our hearts, because we do care about people who are being affected by this, because climate change exacerbates every single humanitarian issue that we already care about so passionately. That's why we care. So thank you. And there's a little global weirding episode called, if I just tell them the facts, they'll change their mind, right? And that goes into this. So watch that episode. <laughs> All right. Question from this side of the room here. Okay. Yes, yes. Change, or one place that you just go, wow, how is it that, finish that sentence. <laughs> how is it that people, who, um, that people who invoke the name of God to justify their actions do so to justify actions that are 180 degrees opposed from what the Bible actually says? Well, it depends. I mean, unfortunately, it's a lot of politicians, a lot of leaders who are doing that. And so directly addressing them is not going to be helpful because if they're not interested in talking, it's not going to make a difference. But when we have individual conversations, that's where I feel like it helps. To start the conversation, first of all, first of all, not with what divides us. So don't start the conversation with what we most disagree on. Start the conversation with what we most agree on. And then, because we both care about, because we're both Christians, because we both care about the poor, because we take what Jesus says seriously, because we're both conservative and we think it's important to conserve, because we care about, um, you know, having a healthy economy, because we care about um, the safety and security of, of people in the armed forces, because, you know, whatever it is that we care about, connect the dots on why, if we are that person, we're exactly the right person to care, and then talk about concrete, tangible things that we can do to fix this problem that fit with who we are, that aren't about letting the government set our thermostat, letting the government take away people's trucks, letting the government destroy the economy. Nobody really wants that. Maybe there's a few people who do, but I don't want that, and most of us don't want that. We, want, we don't want a worse world. We want a better world. So if you want more on how, how I would talk about climate change, how I would have those conversations with people, that's what my TED Talk really gets into. And my TED Talk, again, is... Uh, right here. Okay. Yes. So, talking about talking, mm -hmm. talking are you familiar with um, the Cool Block program that's going to be starting up in Santa Barbara where um, the Empowerment Institute, David Kershaw, uh, he's already met with the uh, city council and they've hired somebody uh, to run it, bring people together on their blocks to not just talk but to help each other reduce their carbon and deal with disaster preparedness and many other things, build community. Are you familiar with that? Um, I'm not involved not in it, but yes. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I, I feel like if there's enough good people doing it, they don't need me. Yeah. But I heard of it and I love it because what is it doing? It's addressing multiple things yes. at the same time. It is building community because one of the big issues of our modern age is that we're very disconnected from each other. So it's introducing ourselves to our neighbors. It's building that sense of community, of having each other's backs, of caring about each other, of loving each other, to use a biblical word. It's also creating resilience against disasters, which we know are going to happen anyways naturally. But it's doing it because we know that they're getting worse in the future. So it's building resilience to a changing climate at the same time. And it's also working to reduce our carbon footprint. 
So it is mitigating, it is adapting, and it is reducing suffering. Win, win, win. Yes. Um, over here, and then at the back, you had a question afterwards, so I can't forget you. Yes. Uh, you know, thank you for the outstanding presentation. This is just unbelievably good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're from Texas, the oil states. My question is, what do you see the oil companies doing now, and what position are they taking around this issue? Mm -hmm. um, the oil companies in, in the U.S. and in Canada as well can be divided pretty much into three groups. And this is for the big ones as well as the smaller ones. Um, first of all, there is a group of oil companies, including some that I've worked with myself in Texas, who recognize that the world is changing very fast and that we are not going to be burning oil in 50 years and that they are going to be stranded assets. And so those oil companies are actually decarbonizing their own industry. So they're powering, ironically, they're powering their oil and gas extraction by wind in Texas. They're cutting their own carbon footprint, but they're also proactively looking ahead to say, how can we survive in this new world because we're not going to try to hold back the tide. We just want to make sure that we're surfing that tide as it goes. Because they do understand energy. They do understand drilling. Drilling is needed for water. What if they turned into the premier drilling company of the, of the area? We're going to keep on, we, we need that geologic expertise. The question is what new things could they apply it to? And there are some companies who are doing that. Then there's the second category of companies, which are in the pull the blanket over my head and pretend there's nothing wrong. Let's just do, 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 do. And then there's the third type of company, which is actively paying organizations to deliberately muddy the waters and harass climate scientists like me in the hopes of continuing our addiction to fossil fuels one more decade by decade by decade so they can make as much money as they can before it all goes to hell in a handbasket. So there's three categories, and I'm glad you asked that question because we often view the, the fossil fuel industry as a monolith. They are not a monolith. There are some people who really recognize the issue and are trying to do the right thing. There's some people who are just frightened. They're just absolutely scared and they don't want to talk or look at it at all. And then there are people who are actively working to do the wrong thing. Yes. Thank you. Well, can you tell us about uh, runaway climate change or it just takes off or something to do by Um, so one of the things that we are most concerned about as climate scientists, and if you want to know more about the science, let me give you a resource there. I, I feel like I have a, let's see. The National Climate Assessment is something that I co-authored, and I'm wondering if I have, oh yes, here it is. Um, if you want to know more, if you want to take a deep dive into the science, I highly recommend this. I wrote a couple of these chapters. The last one, chapter 15, is the most fascinating chapter for a scientist, but it's frankly also the most scary because it directly addresses that question. Chapter 15 talks about what we know that we don't know. And there's a lot that we know that we don't know. And there's even some, even some things that we know that we know that we don't know. Um, and what we know is that we've never seen our planet get this hefty a kick in this short of a time. We've never seen this much carbon being put into the atmosphere. Yeah, the world has been warmer before, but it never happened this fast fast. And that's really important because when stuff happens fast, there can be some really unanticipated surprises. And what we conclude here is that there's a greater chance that those surprises will be negative than positive. And just from a risk perspective, that's why it makes even more sense to try to meet targets like the two degree target that we talked about earlier, because two degrees isn't magic, but the, le the, the, the more we can keep temperature change below what it would otherwise be if we continue on our current pathway, the, gr the greater the chances that we'll avoid the really nasty stuff. You know what I mean? It's like there's no magic number of cigarettes you can smoke before you get lung cancer, but you do know that the less cigarettes you smoke, the greater your chances of avoiding lung cancer, right? So that's kind of the situation there. All right, last question right here. Go for it. Dr. Hugo, we know that you spend a lot of time looking at the data and looking at the effects of the bad decisions that we're making as a society as a planet. How would you recommend that we can keep the issue before us so that we don't get, I guess, um, we, don't, we don't lose our focus and do so in a way that is both edifying and important? Yes. Great last question. That was perfect. So how can we keep our focus on this in a way that is both edifying and hopeful. What I would say is, I don't, 
people often think, well, you know, climate change isn't high enough on our priority list. It might be number 12, it might be number 22. We need to move it up the priority list. We need to work really hard to make it like number three or number four. I don't think it should be on our priority list at all. Because the only reason that I care about a changing climate is because it affects the things that are already one, two, three, four at the top of my priority list today. So the key to this continued dialogue is to integrate it into everything that we already do. What do we care about? What are we working towards? What are we looking at? Healthy, safe communities, disaster resilience, efficiency, reducing the budget, our future career. Integrate it into every aspect of our lives just as much as climate itself is integrated into our lives. So it isn't a standalone issue that you only care about that if you're the climate person. Again, all you have to be is a human, and it's something that affects every aspect of our lives as a human. I mean, my husband and I talk about where we're going to move next, and we take climate change into account when we're having that discussion. Uh, we talk about, he talks about, he's a pastor, so they're having their annual meeting in two weeks, and they're very concerned about the church budget, as they always are. Not worried, but they want to make sure they're using their resources efficiently. So this year, my husband crunched the numbers, and he realized that they would be saving a lot of money over five years if they put solar panels on the church. So they're doing it to save money. Isn't that great? So, so that was in the context of the church budget. And then when I travel, like I do here today, what I do is I have a lot of, of, of demands on my time, so I want to be efficient with my time, but I also want to be efficient with my carbon footprint because flying is the biggest part of my personal carbon footprint. So what I do is I add up invitations and when I get enough in a certain location, that's when I come. So that's why I went to Azusa Pacific and then I went to Pepperdine and then I came here because I could come to one place in the same time and I'm doing it for multiple reasons. I want to see you all. I want to visit your beautiful campus. I, I want to meet with as many people as I can and I want to be efficient with the resources that God has given us. So the key really is to integrate it into every aspect of our lives, number one. And then the second thing is to go out and to actively look for hope. Because hope is not a passive emotion. If you are just sitting there, hope is not going to come find you. It's not going to grab you by the neck. If you turn on the news, you think the news is hopeful? No, it is not hopeful. It runs, the media runs on fear and despair and discouragement and frustration. The worse the news article, the more people click on it. So I actively go out and look for hope. Because I know that that is a big part of what is intended to motivate us as Christians. And there's a really fascinating verse in Romans that talks about how hope actually comes from character. And character comes from perseverance. And perseverance comes from suffering. So our hope as Christians actually comes out of endurance and perseverance and the character it builds, and then the hope comes. So hope, I think, really is key to this because we are called to be a hopeful people. We're not called to be motivated out of fear or despair or guilt. We're called to be motivated out of hope and out of love. I think that's a great place to end. Thank you.